son she chose. He came all so still where his mother was, as dew in April would fall it on the grass. In the last program, we heard some of the work of Geoffrey Chaucer, the first great named poet in English. A man who was not only a great poet, but who moved in the courts of the kings and noblemen of his time, Richard II, John of Gaunt, Henry IV. But from these middle ages, there survive hundreds of other poems whose authors aren't known to us. These are the poems of the ordinary people. Some of them love songs, some ballads or storytelling poems, some lyrics about spring or plowing or death. Some are the earliest nursery rhymes and lullabies in our language. And very many are carols, not just Christmas carols, but celebrations of all the great feast days of the church, often intended to be accompanied by dancing. The one I began with a moment ago is a Christmas carol. Here it is, spoken, not sung, in what is thought to be the original pronunciation. That is, probably a little before the year 1500. I sing of a maiden that is Macalus, king of all kingies, to her son she chairs. He came all so stilly, there his mother was, as dew in April that falleth on the grass. He came all so stilly to his mother's bower, as dew in April that falleth on the flower. He came all so stilly, there his mother lay, as dew in April that falleth on the spray. Mother and maiden was never none but she. Well may such a lady, God's mother, be. Some of these early carols are very mysterious, or mysterious to us. One of these is known as the Corpus Christi carol. At one level, it seems to be about the crucifixion, the Holy Grail, the Eucharist. But some historians and scholars have seen in it a hint or reference to Anne Boleyn, one of Henry VIII's disgraced wives executed for supposed adultery. Whatever the answer to the riddle, the poem is very strange and haunting. Lally, 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 the falcon hath borne my mac away. He bear him up, he bear him down, he bear him into an orchard brown. In that orchard there was an hall that was hanged with purple and tall, and in that hall there was a bed, it was hanged with gold so red, and in that bed there lieth a night his wound is bleeding day and night. By that bedside there kneeleth a may, and she weepeth both night and day. And by that bedside there stondeth a stone, Corpus Christi written thereon. We know a good deal about John Skelton, partly because he was a well-known, even notorious figure the court of Henry VII, and had been the young King Henry VIII's tutor before he came to the throne. Skelton was born about 60 years after Chaucer's death, and became a fierce opponent of Cardinal Wolsey, so much so that he had to leave court for a while and became rector of a parish in South Norfolk. Skelton's poems are full of satirical abuse, grotesqueness, energetic tumble, and deliberate puzzling obscurity. But he also wrote some very gentle and tender lyrics, 
several of them addressed to the Countess of Surrey and other aristocratic ladies, including this one to Mistress Margaret Hussey. Playful, graceful, serene. Mary Margaret, as midsummer flower, gentle as falcon or hawk of the tower, with solace and gladness, much mirth and no madness, all good and no badness, so joyously, so maidenly, so womanly, her demeaning in everything. Far, far passing that I can indict or suffice to write of Mary Margaret, as midsummer flower, gentle as falcon, or hawk of the tower, as patient and as still and as full of goodwill as fair Rissafil, coriander, sweet pomander, good Cassandra, steadfast of thought, well made, well wrought, far may be sought ere uh, that ye can find so courteous, so kind, as merry Margaret, this midsummer flower, gentle as falcon, or hawk of the tower. Later, during the reign of Henry VIII, another poet who got into even graver trouble than Skelton was Sir Thomas Wyatt, an aristocrat, unlike Skelton, who began his career at the age of 21 as clerk of the King's Jewels and went on many diplomatic missions to France and Italy and Spain and Holland. Twice he was imprisoned by Henry, first after being implicated in the Anne Bullen scandal next on a treason charge, because he was an ally of Thomas Cromwell. Twice he was pardoned and released. He managed to die of natural causes at the age of 39. His travels in Italy in his early 20s put him in touch with the Italian poetry of his time, Ariosto and Petrarch, and he both translated their work and learned from it writing his own poems. Wyatt wrote many love songs, songs for the lute, and this poem too, which has an extraordinarily modern ring to it, by which I don't simply mean that its eroticism is more piercing and direct than one finds in most poems of so-called courtly love. This is real feeling, there's no doubt, expressed with passionate realism. They flee from me, that sometime did me seek, with naked foot stalking in my chamber. I have seen them gentle, tame, and meek that now are wild and do not once remember that sometime they have put themselves in danger to take bread at my hand. And now they range, busily seeking with a continual change. Thanked be fortune, it hath been otherwise twenty times better. But once in special, in thin array, after a pleasant guise, when her loose gown from her shoulders did fall, and she me caught in her arms long and small, therewithal sweetly did me kiss, and softly said, Dear heart, I like you this. It was no dream, I lay broad waking, but all is turned thorough my gentleness into a strange fashion of forsaking and I have leave to go of her goodness, and she also to use new fangleness. But since that I so kindly am served, I would fain know what she hath deserved. 16th century England, the England of Henry VIII and Mary and Elizabeth, was by no means the merry England that some people have supposed. Apart from the poverty, the tribulations which could affect the rich and powerful as well. Diseases, plagues, political and religious punishments, tortures and executions. As he waited in the death cell on the eve of his execution, a young man about whom very little is known and from whom nothing else survives, wrote his own elegy, Chidiok Tichborn, who was executed in 1586. My prime of life is but a frost of cares. My feast of joy is but a dish of pain. My crop of corn is but a field of tares, and all my good is but vain hope of gain. My life is fled, and yet I saw no sun, and now I live, and now my life is done. 
spring is past, and yet it hath not sprung. The fruit is dead, and yet the leaves be green. My youth is gone, and yet I am but young. I saw the world, and yet I was not seen. My thread is cut, and yet it is not spun. And now I live, and now my life is done. I sought my death, and found it in my womb. I looked for life, and saw it was a shade. I trod the earth, and knew it was my tomb. And now I die, and now I am but made. My glass is full, and now my glass is run. And now I live, and now my life is done. Even supposed entertainments, spectacles, and dramatic masks and tableaus could include grim matter reflecting the dangers and uncertainties of life. One example from many is by Thomas Nash, a journalist and pamphleteer and hack of all trades, who wrote a lament, he calls it a song, for a staged piece called Summer's Last Will and Testament. Adieu, farewell, earth, this world uncertain is. Fond are life's lustful joys. Death proves them all but toys. None from his dark can fly. I am sick, I must die. Lord, have mercy on us. Rich men trust not in wealth. Gold cannot buy you health. Physic himself must fade. All things to end are made. The plague full swift goes by. I am sick, I must die. Lord, have mercy on us. Beauty is but a flower which wrinkles will devour. Brightness falls from the air. Queens have died young and fair. Dust hath closed Helen's eye. I am sick. I must die, Lord have mercy on us. Strength stoops unto the grave, worms feed on Hector brave. Swords may not fight with faith, earth still holds oath her gate. Come, come, the bells do cry. I am sick, I must die, Lord have mercy on us. Wit with his wantonness tasteth death's bitterness. Hell's executioner hath no ears for to hear what vain art can reply. I am sick, I must die. Lord, have mercy on us. Haste, therefore, each degree to welcome destiny. Heaven is our heritage, earth but a player's stage. Mount we unto the sky. I am sick. I must die. Lord, have mercy on us. The idea of everything passing, of the decay of beauty and wealth and power, is put more fiercely, even politically, in a poem which was almost certainly, but not definitely, written by one of the great men of the Elizabethan age, Sir Walter Raleigh. Great, not just as a writer, but as statesman, soldier, explorer, and adventurer. He was twice disgraced and imprisoned, first by Queen Elizabeth, and finally by James I, by whom he was executed on the ludicrous charge that he was an agent of Spain. This poem, The Lie, is a dignified and stoical homily on the necessity of being honest. Go, so the body's guest, upon a thankless errand. Fear not to touch the best, the truth shall be thy warrant. Go, since I needs must die, and give the world the lie. Say to the court, it glows and shines like rotten wood. Say to the church, it shows what's good and doth no good. If church and court reply, then give them both the lie. Tell potentates they live acting by others' action. Not loved unless they give, not strong but by affection. If potentates reply, 
give potentates the lie. Tell men of high condition that manage the estate, their purpose is ambition, their practice only hate. And if they once reply, then give them all the lie. Tell them that brave it most, they beg for more by spending, who in their greatest cost seek nothing but commending. And if they make reply, then give them all the lie. Tell zeal it wants devotion, tell love it is but lust, tell time it meets but motion, tell flesh it is but dust, and wish them not reply, for thou must give the lie. Tell age it daily wasteth, tell honor how it alters, tell beauty how she blasteth, tell favor how it falters, and as they shall reply, give every one the lie. Tell wit how much it wrangles and tickle points of niceness. Tell wisdom she entangles herself in over-wiseness, and when they do reply, straight give them both the lie. Tell physic of her boldness, tell skill it is prevention, tell charity of coldness, tell law it is contention, and as they do reply, so give them still the lie. Tell fortune of her blindness, tell nature of decay, tell friendship of unkindness, tell justice of delay, and if they will reply, then give them all the lie. Tell arts they have no soundness, but vary by esteeming. Tell schools they want profoundness and stand too much on seeming. If arts and schools reply, give arts and schools the lie. Tell faith it's fed the city. Tell how the country erreth. Tell manhood shakes off pity. Tell virtue least prepareth. And if they do reply, spare not to give the lie. So when thou hast, as I commanded thee, done blabbing, Although to give the lie deserves no less than stabbing, stab at thee he that will. No stab thy soul can kill. That world of jockeying and frustrated ambition and intrigue was also very much the world of Christopher Marlowe, who came from a humble background, his father was a Canterbury cobbler, but who fought his way up the ladder through his cleverness and drive. Not only was he already a successful playwright in his 20s, writing such plays as Tamburlaine and Dr. Faustus for two London companies, but he was also obscurely involved in government service as an agent or even a double agent. And he always lived as he died on the dangerous edge of things, being summoned more than once before the Privy Council for alleged sedition and blasphemy. At the age of 29, he was stabbed to death in a tavern brawl in London. An incident which was hushed up as being an argument over money, but which was much more likely something to do with his activities as a spy. Yet one wouldn't guess any such thing from his elegant and courtly little pastoral lyric, the passionate shepherd to his love. Come live with me and be my love, and we will all the pleasures prove that hills and valleys, dales and fields, or woods or steepy mountain yields. And we will sit upon the rocks and see the shepherds feed their flocks by shallow rivers to whose falls melodious birds sing madrigals. And I will make thee beds of roses and a thousand fragrant poses, a cap of flowers and a kirtle embroidered all with leaves of myrtle. A gown made of the finest wool, which from our pretty lambs we pull, fair lined slippers for the cold with buckles of the purest gold, a belt of straw and ivy buds with coral clasps and amber studs. And if these pleasures may thee move, come live with me and be my love. The shepherd swain shall dance and sing for thy delight each May morning. If these delights thy mind may move, then live with me and be my love. The Elizabethan age was the great age of the sonnet. Fourteen line poems originally following Italian models and often combined in groups or sequences concerned with or addressed to a loved one. Sir Philip Sidney, another soldier courtier poet like Raleigh, wrote many of them and so did Edmund Spencer. Though Spencer's greatest achievement is his huge allegorical pageant, The Fairy Queen a national patriotic vision of love, friendship, beauty, and courage, as exemplified in the person of the Queen herself, Elizabeth. Much of Spencer may seem remote and artificial to people today, and it may be we feel something more direct and striking in the sonnets by his younger contemporary, Michael Drayton. 
Drayton wrote copiously, constantly revising his work throughout his long life. Here is just one of his sonnets from a whole sequence called Idea, a poem of regretful lovers parting at the end of their affair. Since there's no help, come, let us kiss and part. Nay, I have done, you get no more of me. And I am glad, yea, glad with all my heart, that thus so cleanly I myself can free. Shake hands forever, cancel all our vows, and when we meet at any time again, be it not seen in either of our brows that we one jot of former love retain. Now, at the last gasp of love's latest breath, when his pulse failing, passion speechless lies, when faith is kneeling by his bed of death, and innocence is closing up his eyes. Now, if thou wouldst, when all have given him over, from death to life, thou mightst him yet recover. But the most famous sonnets of the Elizabethan age are by a young man who was about to become the dominant playwright, not only of his own time, but throughout all succeeding ages, and not only in England, but throughout the world. William Shakespeare, whose plays will be the subject of the whole of our next program. Shakespeare's 152 sonnets weren't collected together until 1609, but they were probably written in the 1590s when he was in his late 20s. Here is sonnet 129, a grim, remorseless meditation on sexual lust. The expense of spirit in a waste of shame is lust in action. And till action, lust is perjured, murderous, bloody, full of blame, savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust. Enjoyed no sooner, but despise it straight. Past reason hunted, and no sooner had, past reason hated, as a swallowed bait on purpose laid to make the taker mad. Mad in pursuit and in position so, had having and in quest to have extreme, a bliss in proof and proved a very woe, before joy proposed behind a dream. All this the world well knows, yet none knows well to shun the heaven that leads men to this hell. <laughs> 